In this video, I'm going to talk to you about my experience with the Galleon TS-A75 that you can see there behind me. And it's a stereo power amplifier, just a stereo power amplifier. So it should be quite a short and sweet review because how much is there to talk about with a stereo power amplifier? It's just never that simple. Galleon TS-A75 Stereo Power Amplifier is the creation, to some extent, of the Hi-Fi YouTuber Thomas and Stereo, who you may know. Now, for clarification purposes, I do not know Thomas personally. This is the second product of his that I have reviewed, but we have no personal connection to each other, and he will not see this review video before you do. So there is no conflict of interest here. And the Galleon TSA75, or just A75 from now on, is quite an old school looking stereo power amplifier, I'm sure you will agree. Reminiscent of Krell amplifiers maybe from the 90s with the big heat sinks on either side. And I'm going to be harsh here, but fair. I think she looks quite nice, but she is unlikely to win any beauty contests. And also the build quality, while easily good enough, it's solid and heavy enough at over 17 kilograms, with all of the metal used here being very thick. Even the front faceplate, it's very thick. But the A75 is not what I would call a lavish or luxury feeling amplifier. It feels you know, well built and solid, but doesn't have that kind of luxury touch, which I'm absolutely fine with if it means more of my money has been spent on the sound quality or really on the internals to create that sound quality. And how much money are we talking here? Well, $1,495 plus shipping costs. So actually a very reasonable amount of money if the A75 is any good. And that's what's really interesting here because Thomas really has his big kahunas out and swinging for the A75 because he is calling it a giant killer. And a giant killer is that amazing phrase, the thing that everybody wants because it means we're getting a product that costs less, but he's still able to outperform, you know, other products that can cost more from you know big name brands and while that's fantastic and fine i actually think it's potentially very misleading because what giants are we talking about here so i actually think you know it's better to just you know not worry about that kind of hyperbole and i don't blame thomas for praising his products and, and you know hyping up his wares but i would say ignore the hyperbole and just focus on what is important here what does the product do what are its pros and cons? What does it sound like? And does that sound sound appealing to me? And will that sound work well in my system? And that all matters more than any hyperbole that you will see on YouTube. And I am as guilty as the next man. And you can't hate the players. You have to hate the game. However, I wanted to test Thomas's bold claims as I have two amplifier giants here for the Galleon to try and kill. And it doesn't stand a chance. Or does it? For power, no surprise really, the A75 can deliver 75 watts of power per channel into 8 ohms and then 100 watts per channel into 4 ohms. And there is straight away maybe an indication of where the limit might be of the A75 because for me, maybe the best, in inverted commas deliberately, best power amplifiers will double their power from 8 to 4 to 2. And I have one of those amplifiers here that does that, the Griffin Essence, but that costs 20 grand. So there is that difference to think about as well. Thankfully, most modern speakers, the owners are likely to want to use with the A75, they won't be that demanding. And I have tested two, the Revival Audio Atalante 4 and the Kef R11 Meta that you can see there behind me. And both have a similar sensitivity, 89 and 90 decibels respectively, and both are 4 ohms dropping to 3.2 ohms. 
So that should have been a good test for the A75's metal, comparing to the Griffin, which sets the reference point really, and also comparing to the NAD M23, another extremely highly regarded power amplifier. And looking at the rear of the A75, I really like the very sensible layout and I appreciate how everything is nicely spaced out. It shows some extra fault has gone into that. And there is the option for using either single-ended or balanced input connections and cables and I appreciated that. But one thing I'm not massively keen on, if I turn it on for you now, and the button actually is nice, it has a nice kind of clunk to it, but I'm just not sure. On the bright blue, it's so bright against a very understated looking power amplifier. So you know what? It's just a minor, a minor thing, a minor niggle. I popped the hood to look inside and it was cool to see custom galleon stickers being used on the transformers, of which there are two, one for each channel, which is great. And they are reasonable sized 200 watts each, but they are not the dinner plate sized over a kilowatt transformers you get in the Griffin. And there are a lot of capacitors being used here, 20 of them, and they are pretty big ones as well. And it seemed like they are mostly ELNA capacitors, which is a good brand from what I know, which is very little, I will admit. On the website, it's stating 200,000 microfarads of total capacitance, which is a lot. But again, comparing to the Griffin, it has 440,000 per channel. But do remember the price difference. And I would love to be able to go deep into the amplifier's design and start to dissect, you know, what Thomas has done here, but that's way above my pay grade. However, if you can add anything that you think will be interesting, please let us all know down below in the comments section while you're down there pressing that all important subscribe button. <laughs>
which then limits the sense of depth availability. Well, there may be an amplifier that could help it maybe extend that a little bit or create an extended sense of depth to your soundstage could be very appealing to you. But at the same time, it might you know divide opinion here, especially if you're used to or like a more upfront, immediate sounding sound or an amplifier that you know has a bit more you know drive and immediacy to it because the A75 is definitely trying to go the other way. And the treble Thomas told me is deliberately raised some, you know, elevated some. And that was interesting because had he not told me that, I don't think I would have really noticed it because if it is elevated or raised a bit, then it's very, very subtle in the way it's been done, which is good because, you know, nobody wants an overly bright sound, but maybe just an emphasis of treble detail could be good with a lot of speakers for a lot of maybe older audio files especially, but me too, that little bit of extra treble emphasis with certain speakers like the Kefs can be a really good thing. But interestingly, the treble delivery, the quality of the treble also has just a little bit of extra special character to it. Like there's a little bit of maybe bloom going on with the treble. So like you, you don't really notice there being too much extra. And the only reason you might even notice it is someone like me giving you the information, right? To, to listen for it, or maybe in a comparison, you would notice it, but it's like I said, it's subtle, but the treble just has a little bit of extra character to it. So it's not as overly crispy sounding. So it doesn't irritate, you know, there's no like harshness or extra energy, it's just a bit more highlighted, a bit more stand out the treble information, which can be a good thing, of course. And interestingly, comparing it to the NAD M23, the treble definitely sounds more sparkly and more bloomy and a little bit more special maybe than from the NAD, because the NAD I think has quite a toned down type of treble delivery. But the crispness of the treble is definitely not there. Like the precise precision of the notes is definitely not there from the galleon like it can be from the big griffin. The bass, the bass, <laughs> Thomas told me is definitely kind of a big part of the A75 design. It's designed to be big. And I think he told me that probably because, you know, so I'm a little bit of a bass head. So of course that might appeal to me. And the bass is definitely there from the A75. It was definitely, you know, a good amount of bass, very pleasing, you know, in, in that regard. And I enjoyed it, you know, having a bit more, you know, bass balls. <laughs> I enjoyed that aspect. And funny enough, interestingly, the bass, from the A75, in particular with the Kef R11 Meta speakers behind me, the Kefs are so tight articulate for their bass, like they're wound so tight, or at least they are at the moment for me. The A75 seemed to just add a little bit of bass bloom. I'm gonna call it character, but it was just a little bit of bass bloom. So it just fattened the bass out just a little bit and rounded it off, and made the bass just that little bit more pleasing, which worked really nicely with the Kef's very tight, articulate, wound tight bass delivery. But most impressive, and or interesting and impressive, was that it didn't come, that slight bloom didn't come at the expense of the Kef's very tight, fast articulation of bass. Like they want to deliver every single note, ultra start stop. And it was still there, ultra start stop with the A75 driving them, showing it's got really good control of the speakers, but it just, just loosened off that bass delivery just a little bit, adding just a little bit of bass character, which I liked actually, I thought it worked really nicely with these speakers. But interestingly, comparing to the NAD M23, which has definitely got a bolder bass delivery, so I quite like that amplifier. The bass with the Kefs with the NAD M23 was definitely what I would call more solid, like thicker, more, more solid, more thick in the middle of the soundstage. So it had a, has a bit more impact, there's a bit more kind of mid bass impact, a bit more drive and a bit more solidity. But interestingly, it didn't have or doesn't have quite the same nimble articulation with the Kef speakers than you get from the Galleon. So it really depends on what music you're listening to, whether that mid bass punch and thickness and fullness and kind of middle region being more solid adds something or whether it takes it away. So maybe listening to something like some big vibing reggae could add something, maybe listening listening to classical music, it might congest the soundstage a little bit. So it's an interesting, <laughs> it's a really interesting difference there. But the bass from the uh, A75 is very, very good quality. I like the character of the bass. So yeah, it gets a, gets a tick in my box for quality. I know soundstage is important to Thomas, and that's one of the things that the A75 is praised for having a good soundstage. And interestingly, with it in the system with the Kefs, listening to certain music, 
The sense of three-dimensionality or the sense of the sound to go away from you was very impressive. It's as, as good as I can get in this listening room, which is very small. I do have the speakers pulled quite a long way away from the front wall, but it's still a limited size listening room. So the sense of, it's always limited anyway, isn't it? You know, the sound that goes away from us beyond the speakers, but I can say the Galleon did that as good as any other amplifier that I've had in here. So very, very good. And the overall sense of three dimensionality was pretty good. However, when I compared to the NAD M23, the NAD seemed to have what I would class as like a better left to right soundstage. The Galleon's very organized and precise in that regard, but because it has that kind of go away from you sound in the middle region, the trade-off of that is the left to right sounds, you know, like an instrument to the left or very obvious, you know, piece of music to the right. With the NAD, they have more purpose. They're more solid, they're more full. And it sounds more like there's a person maybe playing an instrument to the left or the right. So it has a bit more solidity, a bit more impact. Again, I think because the NAD wants to give it this more upfront kind of, you know, driving forceful direct sound. And the Galleon's a bit more go away and a bit more soft. So... In some regards, it's better. In some regards, there's a trade-off. And I think just to take that a little bit further, I did notice with both speakers, actually, the Kefir 11 Meta and the Revival Audio Atalante 4. That sense of go away, that sense of the vocals being just that a bit further back is great in some regards, but with, with some music, it can make the vocals just sound a little sucked out, just like a little lacking and sucked out in some regards. And in particular, I'm thinking of one of my favorite albums, actually, Coal to Wall Songs of the Plains, where it has this really kind of impactful, bold, gruff vocal in most of the songs. And with the NAD, in particular with the Griffin, with the, the Revival Audio Atalante 4 speakers, that vocal was really solid and kind of big and impactful in the center of the soundstage. And when you take that back to give you a sense of depth, yes, that is nice from a, a, a holographic soundstage and point of view, but the way that vocal can be presented, that immediate up close to a microphone goes away a little bit and it kind of sounds a little bit sucked out. So like everything in audio, there's pros and cons to everything. And it's, it's definitely a different way of presenting that same piece of music. And lastly, I want to talk about atmosphere in music. And it's not in all music, it's just in some music. It's something that I've been thinking about more and more as I've been listening through different speakers. And the Kefs are not the best example of this because their high frequencies are really quite rolled off. I noticed this really well and really a lot with the Revival Audio Atalante 4 that seem to have a very high, tall sound and a really nice sense of atmosphere. And by atmosphere, I just mean sounds that seem to come out into the room and just create a sense of exactly that, atmosphere. And interestingly, I think that mostly comes from our music's extremes. Bass does it in some regard, but I think it's the high frequencies that really extend the sound up into this... I don't know, maybe it's psychoacoustic, but like some, some higher frequency region. And interestingly, I think the Galleon will do that really well because of the way it's designed treble-wise, that little bit of extra spice and life going on in the treble, more so than an amplifier like the NAD M23, because like I said, it has it seems to have like a, a little bit of a shutdown treble to me in terms of, yeah, just a difference with other amplifiers. So to sum things up then, I hope you've got something out of that main comparison there between the Galleon and the NAD M23. For me, the Galleon TSA75, it's a power amplifier with a lot of positive qualities and an obvious character with some charm thrown in for good measure. The kind of charm that makes music very pleasurable to listen to with no real obvious weak points until you do some kind of comparison, which is why you do them of course. But it's important to stress that the comparisons I've been doing are with amplifiers that cost, I think, twice as much and about 15 times as much. So, sorry, Thomas, no, no giants were killed in the making of this video, but the, just the fact that I'm having this conversation, that the Galleon's holding its own, more so with the NAD than the, than the Griffin, but the fact that the Galleon's holding its own with the NAD M23, an extremely highly regarded power amplifier that costs twice as much, is a very good thing and there's a lot of praise obviously going in there. Yes, it's different, but it's holding its own, which is a very big thing because it means, you know, for a very reasonable amount of money, you are getting a very good power amplifier here, which is fantastic for the consumer, of course. But I just want to finish the review with a thought really because it's interesting that 
Thomas has released a power amplifier before a preamplifier because, of course, the preamplifier that you're going to use is going to massively affect what you get from the power amplifier. So I have to throw, you know, hats up in the air, cards up in the air. I wonder if Thomas is working on a preamplifier. That's pure speculation. I have absolutely no idea. I think more interestingly is that I wonder if Thomas has thought about all of the streaming DAC preamplifier type products that are available on the market from Eversolo, Aurelic, Hi-Fi, Rose, the Audio Lab 9000N that I looked at recently. All of these products are streaming DACs with some of them have got very good preamplifiers in. And, you know, if my experience is with some of these streaming DAC preamplifiers in the maybe 1000 to 2000 pound price ranges, in my experience, some of those have quite a, what I'm going to call quite a clinical sound. It's to add a power amplifier to them that adds a bit of charm, that adds a bit of sweetness, that adds a bit of, you know, set the vocals back a touch, you know, a bit more boldness in the bass, a little bit of special character in the treble. Maybe that would be a really nice balancing act system, you know, which is what Hi-Fi is all about. That system, you know, curation that gets the magic sound that we're looking for. Maybe this amplifier will work really well in those regards. So maybe that's a little extra something for you to think about while you go down there and hit that thumbs up button because of course you've loved the video and subscribe to the channel.